Welcome to Enter the Unknown, your one-stop shop for answers to questions that you were never bored enough to ask. My name is FJ, and after coming up with this idea well over a year ago, I'm finally giving this a run. Today I'll be asking the question, can you beat Pokemon Fire Red using Quad Week Pokemon? This won't be possible in every major battle, but wherever I can I'll be making use of Pokemon who are Quad Week to their opponents. If that's not an option, then any Pokemon that is susceptible to super effective moves can fill the spot. So, for example, against Sabrina's Psychic types, we're free to use any Poison or Fighting type Pokemon as no Quad Week Pokemon existed prior to Gen 4. Against Lieutenant Surge's Electric types, however, we'll be forced to use only Water Flying types. An additional rule I've thrown in is that I have to make use of all available options before I can double up. That way, instead of using a group of four Scizor against Blaine, we'll have to put Paris, Parasect, and Fortress in our team. I'll be matching levels exactly with our opponents and not using any items in battle, but unlike usual, I won't be using a set battle style. The reason for that is that in a few battles, especially those against Gary, each of the Pokémon will have a match that we'll need to use against them only. Alright, hopefully that's made everything somewhat clear, if not, it should all make sense as we get into it. As always, our journey begins in Pallet Town when we run into the venerable Professor Oak. After heading back to his lab, we've got to pick a starter Pokémon for our first battle. I decided to let Gary take Squirtle, although in retrospect, I think Charmander may have made things slightly easier. Anyway, as he's taking a water type, we've got a bunch of options to choose from. There's no need to overthink things just yet, though. Any powerful Pokémon should make things easy, so we grab a ride on as that seems appropriate for the very beginning and get going. At this level, Squirtle only knows Tackle and Tail Whip, so there's basically no way to lose this. Rhydon only takes a couple of turns to knock off Gary's starter, who only succeeds in lowering our defense. One down. Even though it's optional, we're gonna challenge our rival again on Route 22, as he'll actually have two Pokémon with quite effective moves. So, after completing some chores for Professor Oak, we head west of Viridian City in search of our rival. After failing in our first face-off, he's added a Pidgey to his lineup, so we're picking up a hair across as our quad week matchup. At level 9, Gary's Pidgey knows Gust, and his starter, Squirtle, has learned Bubble. We're obviously sticking with Rhydon for the time being, so let's see how this goes. I'm not entirely sure that the critical hit on Horn Attack was necessary for a one-shot, but Pidgey goes down either way, so it works out for us. As we know Gary's going out to Squirtle, we switch out to Rhydon. Horn Attack is the official sponsor of our team, so there's no need to change things up when Rhydon enters. It doesn't do too much, but Gary isn't the smartest, so he calls for Tackle. Not that it would have mattered, but Squirtle didn't even make contact anyway. A stomp is countered by a successful tackle before Horn Attack finishes off our rival once again. Having dealt with him once more, we can move on to the first gym battle in Pewter City. That's where Brock resides, and that means we'll need a couple of Pokémon who are quad weak to rock types. So, we'll need any Pokémon who combine any two of Bug, Fire, Ice, and Flying. That gives us a few fun options. The early game will be slightly easier as our opponents will be using a lot of unevolved Pokémon, so I think our duo here may be a little bit overpowered? We're going to be using the team of Moltres and Articuno. That puts us in pretty good shape for the battle, so let's get into it. We start the battle off with an Ember on Geodude as Brock calls for Defense Curl. The Pewter Gym Leader's first Pokémon doesn't actually know any Rock-type moves, so this was never going to be a problem. Ember eventually takes him down to leave Brock with only his Onyx. We switch out to Articuno for the second face-off of the battle, and unfortunately Powder Snow isn't enough. We get lucky again though as Onyx misses Rock Tomb, so Powder Snow makes quick work of the Rock Snake. That's a couple of lucky battles in a row, but that'll probably be the last easy ride we have in a gym battle. From here on out, things are going to get incredibly tough. After picking up the running shoes, we head through Mount Moon and make our way down Route 4 into Cerulean City. Before having to think too much about Misty, we're going north towards Nugget Bridge for our third battle against Gary. At this point, he's caught Abra and Rattata and evolved his Pidgey into Pidgeotto. We're sticking with Heracross and Rhydon for now, and we've added Hitmonlee to take on Abra. It doesn't really matter who we use against the Psychic type, as he only knows Teleport, but I like Hitmonlee, so that's who we're choosing. Finally, as Rattata is a normal type who only knows normal type moves, I've just picked Moltres because it's at the same level and it doesn't really make any difference. Alright, let's give this a go. We get things going with Gary's Pidgeotto facing off against Heracross. Horn Attack takes the bird below half health, but this time Gary actually calls for Gust. The quad effective attack cuts away around two thirds of her HP before another crit Horn Attack finishes the job. Our rival calls on his Abra next, and that means it's time for Hitmonlee. A series of swift kicks clobber the tiny psychic type as he tries and fails to teleport away. The next face off sees Moltres taking on Rattata, and again, this isn't really important in the context of the video as we can't choose anything that works. 
The legendary bird one-shots the rat with wing attack to waste as little time as possible, so that just leaves Squirtle and Rhydon. Once again, Gary's soft spot for Rhydon is clear. He decides against using any water-type attacks, going for withdraw instead. Rhydon's stomp brushes Squirtle aside to take us to 3-0 against Gary. Unfortunately, we can't put it off anymore. Our next battle will be against Misty, and that's problematic for several reasons. None of the 11 potential quad weak Pokemon have any chance of outspeeding Starmie. Onix could possibly outspeed Staryu with maxed out speed EVs, but not Starmie. So we're gonna get hit. For that reason, I've settled on Magcargo and Camerupt, who have the best special defense out of all of our options. The hope is that by raising their special defense and HP EVs, we may just be able to tank a Water Pulse from Starmie. Let's give this a try. We send out camera up for starters against Staryu, and Misty lets us off the hook by calling for Harden. That's not enough for Staryu to survive a magnitude 7 from camera up though, so that's a perfect start for us. With Misty set to send in Starmie, we switch out to Mag Cargo and try to use Yawn. Before even getting the chance though, the Fire Slug's blown away by Water Pulse. Camera up returns to battle, and again, Water Pulse scores a one shot. Let's run that back. Once again, Misty decides against attacking with Staryu, allowing us to take an early lead with a magnitude 8. This time around, Starmie's Water Pulse comes up just short of knocking out Camera Up, so he's able to counter with magnitude. Sadly, it's just a magnitude 5, so it barely leaves a mark. Swift cuts down the fire type, and yet again, Macargo contributes absolutely nothing. Alright, let's try that again. Magnitude takes us into a 2 on 1 again, so let's hope for a bit more luck this time. Another low roll keeps Camera Up standing after Water Pulse, and this time he's not messing around. A magnitude 9 blasts Starmie back, leaving it in red health, which may just give us a chance. Instead of attacking to guarantee her win, Misty decides to heal Starmie with the Super Potion. That allows Camera Up to strike once more with magnitude. Even though it's only a magnitude 7, a critical hit takes its power almost as high as a 10. I'm not sure I've ever been as excited to win a battle as I was for that. The reason I put this challenge off for so long was because I didn't think there was any chance of me beating Misty. It's very unexpected, but let's move on. You saw Bill give us a ticket for the SSN earlier, and that's where our next battle will be. It's another rival battle, and other than a trio of evolutions, Gary's team is unchanged. Once again, his normal type only has normal moves, so it's not important, but only Heracross is retaining her place on our team. We've replaced Hitmonlee with Primeape, as speed is now of the utmost importance. Honestly, the only reason my car goes replacing Rhydon is because I EV trained her and then she didn't do anything against Misty. I wanted to use Camera Up, but we needed a level 20 and you can't go backwards. Finally, I replaced Moltres with Celebi, just because, why not? If this is truly going to be the end of Raticate, we may as well let him see a mythical Pokemon. Alright, let's just get through this one quickly, I don't want Gary to take up the whole video. Pidgeotto's probably getting a bit sick of being embarrassed by Heracross at this point. Knowing you've got a quad effective move but constantly failing can't be much fun. Kadabra actually manages to outspeed Primeape, so we're gonna have to work on her EVs before next time. We've also got to get a consistent, powerful normal type attack because anything with Fury in its name cannot be trusted. Finally, Mag Cargo was just an atrocious matchup here, but Yawn and Rock Throw combine nicely. Well, thanks to a critical hit they do. So that's all for the SSN rival battle. We do have to head upstairs before leaving to do some unsavory things with the captain, because without the HM for cut, we can't reach Search's gym. Speaking of, our team has basically been selected for us in this one. Surge has a team of three, and there are only four water flying types in existence at this point. We've got Garados, Mantine, Wingull, and Pelipper. We're hardly going to be taking Wingull over any of the others, so we'll be taking on Lieutenant Surge with Garados, Mantine, and Pelipper. It's not a great team, but that's sort of the whole point of the video. We needed Heracross in our party to use Cut too, but he's fainted so he can't interfere in battle. Let's get this going. Against Surge's Voltorb, Mantine's insane special defense stat allows him to survive through Shockwave. That means he can follow up with Bubble Beam to score the knockout and hand us the advantage. Mantine then outspeeds Pikachu and falls just short of another KO before falling to Shockwave. Pelipper comes in next on our side, and thanks to a super potion, Pikachu has more HP when Pelipper faints than when she entered the battle. Solid work, Pelipper. That leaves Gardos in a 1 on 2, so when he enters, we go straight for Thrash. It quickly takes down Pikachu, meaning only Raichu remains for Surge. Starting off with Double Team for no real reason, Raichu allows Gardos to get in a free hit with Thrash. It's not enough to score the one shot, though. A shockwave shakes Gardos to his core, but he lives the hit in red health. One final slam of Thrash eliminates Raichu, leaving the Water Dragon paralyzed and weak, but standing. 
We got a bit lucky with the move selections, but actually got through that in one go, surprisingly. Erica's the next gym leader in our sights, so we've got to head for Celadon City. The grass type gym leader leaves us with a lot of the same options as Misty earlier, but we can replace all of the fire types with water types. We're going to be doing just that, going for a full team of water types here, with Swampert, Quagsire, and Kabutops making up our trio. We've reached the point in the game now where you can just assume that before every battle I've maxed out our team's EVs. Before getting into this, we spent some time in the Celadon game corner to earn enough coins to get a couple of Ice Beam TMs. That should hopefully help us get through Erika's team quickly before she can take advantage of her quad effective attacks. Alright, let's get into the battle. Erika leads off with her victory bell and we start things with Swamper. Ice Beam annihilates the grass type in one, but Vileplume comes in next and stands up to it a little bit better. Erika's second Pokemon ends the turn in red health, but paralyzes Swampert with Stun Spore. Before Ice Beam can finish it, Erika uses a Hyper Potion to heal her up completely. That Ice Beam ends up freezing Vileplume though, so that's really the end for her. Erika breaks out another item using a full heal to defrost her, but it's just in time to give Ice Beam an open target to destroy. When Erika sends in Tangela, we switch out to Quagsire, who lazily dodges Poison Powder before countering with an Ice Beam of his own. It one-shots the pair of headphones that I literally just put down and hands us what was a fairly easy win. That battle probably took more time to prepare for than any other though. We needed to earn a lot of coins and also grind three Pokemon up to maxed out EVs. A bit frustrating as we didn't even use Kabutop, so we'll have to make use of him later. Now that we've half filled our batch case, we've got a couple more rival battles in front of us before we can make for another gym. For our next face off with Gary, we have to head to Lavender Town and visit the Pokemon Tower. This is going to be the first time we see Gary's team nearing its completed form. For this one, he's let Raticate go and added Growlithe and Execute. Let's just jump right into it. We get yet another rival battle going with Heracross against Pidgeotto. For the fourth time in a row, Heracross eases past the flying type, handing us the first win of the match. When Execute comes in for Gary, we call on our newest match in Golem. We almost messed things up allowing Execute to use Hypnosis, but with only 7 hit points left, Golem wakes up and uses Self-Destruct to beat the Cracked Eggs. Unfortunately, with both of them down, we have to select our Pokemon first now, so we're forced to guess who Gary will call on next, but luckily we guess right. The battle's third face-off sees Growlithe taking on Scizor. It's another close run race thanks to poor move selections from Gary as Secret Power paralyzes Growlithe before finishing him off. Scizor is burned and struggling by the end of it, but it's another win that leaves only two. War Turtle's up next, and thanks to the level increase, we can call on camera up once more. A massive magnitude 9 almost blows away the evolved Water Starter as Gary wastes another golden opportunity calling for withdrawal. A second magnitude knocks out War Turtle to take Gary down to one. The final matchup sees Primate going up against Kadabra for the second time. By outspeeding him, the fighting type takes advantage of his low defense, scoring us the win with return. That wasn't too bad. We've got some good opponents for our rival's team now, which will be important going forward. After kicking Team Rocket out of the Pokemon Tower, Mr. Fuji gives us the Poke Flute, so with that out of the way, let's move on to Sylphco. There's a big level jump from the Pokemon Tower battle to here, which means evolutions for Pidgeotto, Kadabra, and Wartortle. That should up the difficulty level, so hopefully Heracross, Primeape, and Camerupt are up to the task. We're bringing in Kabutops to replace Golem here because I really don't want all of that grinding to go to waste. Alright, here goes nothing. Pidgeot must be thinking that this final evolution is the step necessary to get past Heracross, but he is sorely mistaken. Wing attack isn't enough for a one shot, so a couple of brick breaks take him out. Kabutops vs Execute is next in line, and once again the dropped carton does better than he has any right to. Without a single quad effective attack on hand, Execute goes very close to wiping out Kabutops by combining Paralysis and Confusion. Aerial Ace ultimately earns Kabutops the win, but like Golem, he wasn't in great shape at the end. Alakazam is up next for Gary, but this is the battle where his only attack has Future Sight, so we're not in much trouble. Primate picks up the win with return and then gets out of there before Future Sight can do anything. It's another Scizor vs Growlithe battle next, and when Secret Power fails to score the knockout, Flame Wheel cremates the Quad Weak Pinsir Pokemon. Hmm. We're gonna jump back in at this point. After Heracross, Kabutops, and Primate do their parts, we get back to the Scizor Growlithe face-off. On this occasion, Secret Power paralyzes the Fire-type, and that's gonna be enough. It stops him from hitting Flame Wheel, so even though Scizor's hit by Future Sight, she earns the knockout with a second Secret Power. Gary sends in Blastoise, so we go out to camera up to hopefully finish things off. For some reason, at level 40, Gary's Blastoise only has Bubble and Water Gun, so camera up takes the hit, countering with a Crit Earthquake to get us over the line. 
that's the last we'll be seeing of Gary for a while, so let's get back to some gym battles. The next couple aren't vital to the video as Sabrina and Koga specialize in types without any quad weak options for us. Sabrina does have her Venomoth whose bug typing gives us some choice, but Koga is pure poison across the board. Let's start with the Saffron City Gym Leader because that's closer. We've got Primate, Machamp and Hitmonlee to face off against Sabrina's Psychic types and Celebi who's quad weak to bug. Let's get into it. Primate really just runs roughshod through the Psychic type portion of Sabrina's team. Return annihilates Kadabra, Mr. Mime and Alakazam to take Sabrina down to one in no time. She may as well have sent all three out at once. When Venomoth is called on, we go out to Celebi, who really just wants to avoid Leech Life. Confusion damage from Supersonic and a Hyper Potion really slow things down, but after a few blasts of Ancient Power, Venomoth finally faints. Leech Life did take Celebi down to red health, but that really wasn't a difficult battle. Let's move on to Fuchsia City and search for Gym Badge number 6. With the introduction of the fairy typing in Gen 6, there are now a few Pokemon who are quad weak to poison, but as of Fire Red, we don't have any options. So we're just gonna have to stick with any Pokemon who are weak to poison. That means we can keep Celebi in our team, which should make things easier, along with the additions of Executor, Meganium, and Sceptile. Let's see how this goes. We lead off with Celebi against the first of Koga's coughings and get things started with a future sight. Before the mythical Pokemon's premonition comes to be, Coughing goes down to a couple of crashing ancient powers. That also gives Celebi an across the board stat boost. Koga sends in his Muck next who's hit by the earlier future sight before another ancient power takes us into a 4 on 2. Coughing number 2 seems set to meet the same fate as his twin but a miss on ancient power allows him to self destruct. When Weezing is sent in, Celebi is left poisoned and in red health. To add insult to some serious injuries, future sight fails. After foreseeing another attack, Celebi is knocked out by Sludge, so no sweep today. We call on Executor next, whose confusion takes Weezing deep into red health before filling the gym with smoke. We then get a triple whammy as Koga uses a Hyper Potion, Executor misses confusion, and Future Sight fails again. Hypnosis then puts Weezing to sleep, so Koga digs back into his bag of tricks and breaks out a full heal. Another surge of confusion leaves Weezing dazed and confused, so to stay on form, Koga uses another Hyper Potion. After yet another miss, Confusion takes Weezing back into red health before the poison type hits himself in Confusion, finally handing us the win. Okay, that's that for gym leaders that don't fit into the challenge. The final two Kanto gym leaders both specialize in types that can deal quad damage, so let's move on to the first of them. After surfing south of Pallet Town, we reach Cinnabar Island where Blaine hangs his hat. Where's Wake? We're both. As he uses fire types, we can use any Pokemon who combines any two of Grass, Bug, Ice, and Steel. As of the third gen, that only actually gives us four options, which is exactly how many Pokemon Blaine uses. So our team is set out for us. We're going to be using Scizor, Paris, Parasect, and Foratress. It's not exactly a promising lineup, but let's give it a go. Blaine leads off with his Growlithe, and we start things out with Scizor. After Growlithe's Intimidate lowers Scizor's attack, we switch out to Paris, who's very much just a sacrificial parasite. Fire Blast destroys the weird mushroom bug Thing, so we're free to swap Scizor back into battle. Without the lowered attack stat, Scizor Slash cuts down Growlithe to tie up the match. Ponyta comes in for Blaine, and yet again a single slash is good for the knockout. Rapidash is next in line for the Cinnabar Gym Leader, and thanks to a critical hit, it's another one-shot from Slash. Arcanine is up last, and with another Intimidate coming, we switch out to Parasite. Fire Blast sautés the Mushroom Pokémon, so we call on Faradress next to see if she can do any better. Arcanine's Fire Blast hits its mark once more, destroying the Steely Bug to take us into a one-on-one. -on -one. Sizzle returns to the battlefield and strikes fast with Slash, and our luck finally comes through with Fire Blast going off target. After considering Secret Power, we go for Slash once more, and a very timely critical hit earns us another Gym Badge. That may have seemed like a lucky run, and it really was, but it was only our second attempt. Other than Misty, this was the Gym Battle that I was most worried about. As it turns out, a Scizor with maxed out attack and speed EVs can be pretty handy. That's it for Cinnabar, there's only one gym to go now. We return to Viridian City, where the final Kanto gym is located, for our battle with Giovanni. As of Gen 3, only 6 Pokemon are quad weak to ground types, so we're only going to be leaving one out. Our options are Magnemite, Magneton, Magcargo, Aron, Laron, and Agron, so I think we'll be taking everyone but Magnemite. With a full team of Agron, this would seem like a fairly decent battle, but with this team, I think it's going to be tough. The final Kanto gym battle gets underway with Agron facing off against Rhyhorn. We've got a surfing Agron, so this shouldn't be a problem. 
A crashing wave washes away Giovanni's first Pokemon and happy with that showing, the gym leader calls on Rhyhorn number two next. Surf takes care of business once again and just like that, we're into a five on three. When Giovanni sends out Dugtrio, we recall Agron to send in Laron. Dugtrio's speed is too much for every member of our team, so we need to be careful here. Laron's bulk helps him live through an earthquake so he can fire back with Iron Tail, earning another knockout for his evolutionary line. When Giovanni sends out Nidoqueen, we stay in just to see if we get lucky, but Double Kick only gets to land once before Laron's unconscious. Being quad weak to multiple typings really didn't work in his favour there. We send Agron back in, but Surf isn't enough for a one shot this time. Nidoqueen shakes things up with Earthquake, but before Agron can land the final blow, Giovanni uses a Hyper Potion. Another Surf is then met by another Hyper Potion, but he's just stuck in an endless cycle now. Unless he has enough healing items to run Agron out of PP for Surf, we've got this one won. Knowing that, Giovanni gives up on the Hyper Potions, allowing Nidoqueen to faint, taking us into a 4 on 1. Nidoking enters the battle and outspeeds Agron to just immediately make it a 3 on 1. That's not ideal. We send in Aron first just to see if she can cause an upset, but another Earthquake tosses the debris around, crushing her to take our advantage down to 1. In no time at all, Magcargo meets the same fate, so now it's a 1 on 1. Magneton vs Nidoking The three heads charge up a tri-attack that connects, burning Nidoking. For some reason, they then drop to the ground to make sure his Earthquake deals some damage. The burn actually keeps Magneton alive because the attack drop that comes with it is the only reason that it can live in an Earthquake. Giovanni then foolishly wastes a turn on a full heal that's completely unneeded so Magneton can attack twice. Tri-Attack burns Nidoking again just for a laugh, and with that extra bit of health chipped away, another one does just enough for the win. I really thought we had no chance after Agron went down, but that was a pretty amazing performance from Magneton. Alright, the Earth Badge makes 8, so we're now just one step away from the Elite Four. First, we have to head back to Route 22 for another rival battle with Gary. After all this time, he's finally assembled a full team of six, and we have quad weak options against five of them. Alakazam will still be matched up against Primate, but other than that, we've got a quintet of quad weak qualifiers. I did run this battle several times with Camera up to cross from Blastoise, but I realized that the only way to win would be a critical hit on a Magnitude 10, which is a 1 in 320 chance, so switched things up and went for Golem instead. Thankfully, Gary starters at level 53 for this one, because that happens to be the exact level at which Golem learns Explosion. Anyway, let's see if this tactic works any better. You've seen the Pidgeot Heracross face off enough times by now to know exactly what's coming. Even Pidgeot is begging to be replaced at this point. As ever, he gets sort of close to knocking out Heracross, but Brick Break earns her the win. Alakazam's up against Primeape next, and the fighting type is still just about managing to outspeed, but her return leaves him with the tiniest sliver of health. That means Psychic is free to blow away Primeape, so let's try that again. After Heracross takes down Pidgeot for the umpteenth time, we decide to call for Swagger instead of Return. Alakazam hits himself in confusion with his raised attack, and Return does the rest. Alright, this team's starting to come together. Unfortunately, Scizor is overleveled after the Blaine battle, so we're using Parasect against Growlithe instead. After Intimidate kicks in, Gary wastes a turn calling for Leer against a Pokemon who he's surely only planning to hit with special attacks. That gives Parasect a free turn to use Spore and put Growlithe right to sleep. Without a critical hit, two swipes of Slash aren't enough to knock out Growlithe though, so he wakes up and lands a Flame Wheel, but Parasect takes it pretty well. A rather late and unnecessary crit finishes things for the Fire Dog, so we're halfway done. Agron vs Rhyhorn is next on the card, and as the Agron we used against Giovanni was at level 50, this is our Laron having evolved. A single Surf is easily enough to take down Gary's newest team member though, so that leaves only two. Blastoise is up next, and this one will be telling. Golem's special defense isn't as good as Camerupt, but after some EV training, he isn't too badly hurt by Water Gun. Thankfully, at level 53, Gary still hasn't taught him Surf, so Golem's free to use Explosion and the Blast destroys everything in sight. Blastoise is blown away, taking Gary down to one. The final face-off sees Execute taking on Swampert, so I'm really not too worried here. Ice Beam one-shots the Grass-type, finishing off Gary to hand us another win. You've got to think this is really starting to get to him. Constantly being shown up by a rival who only uses the worst possible typing options? Anyway, that's it. We've made it to the Elite Four. Only the best of the best remain now. Part of the fun behind this idea came from the fact that if I ever made it to Lorelei, I could pick a really ridiculously powerful team. Her ice types are four times effective against any Pokemon who combines any two of grass, ground, dragon, and flying. After always being tormented by her in challenges, I think I've finally got a team that may be up to scratch. 
Against the Kanto Elite Force first member, we're going to be using the team of Rayquaza, Dragonite, Flygon, Salamence, and Altaria. I'm pretty happy with this group. The stupid thing is, I still know this won't be easy. The beginning of our Elite Four journey sees Lorelei's Dugong staring up at Rayquaza. Thunderbolt can only take her into red health sadly, so Dugong's able to get off an Ice Beam. Rayquaza's also up to the challenge and survives, so Lorelei's full restore is nothing but a stalling tactic. Another couple of Thunderbolts take down the Sea Lion to give us the first lead of the battle. Slowbro's next up for Lorelei, and although she's very tanky defensively, her special defense isn't on par with Dugong. Thunderbolt one-shots Slowbro before she even realizes there's a battle happening. When Jinx comes in, we go out to Altaria, whose takedown softens her up a bit, but Ice Punch does more than that. Altaria goes down in one, handing us our first loss of the match. Flygon's next in line, and his crunch gets a little bit of revenge for Altaria, dealing more damage than necessary with a critical hit. When Lorelei sends in her Lapras, we go for Dragon Breath, which barely fades her as she counters with a powerful Ice Beam. That's the end of Flygon, so let's see what Dragonite can do. Thunderbolt actually doesn't do too much, so Lapras can strike with another Ice Beam, but Dragonite is equal to it. Just. Surviving on 1 HP, Dragonite sends another Thunderbolt right at Lapras, who also survives the hit on, well, around 1 HP. Another Ice Beam cuts down Dragonite, but that really could have gone either way. Salamence is out next on our side, and after a full restore heals up Lapras, she's free to attack twice with Dragon Breath. It doesn't even take the water type below half health, though. Ice Beam finds another victim, so now we're down to one. Rayquaza returns to battle, finally eliminating Lapras with a Thunderbolt to make it a one-on-one. -on -one. Cloister's up last, and this is one of those occasions where having a base defense stat four times higher than your base special defense really isn't going to pay off. Thunderbolt crashes into the bivalve Pokemon, easily one-shotting her to hand us a very narrow win. That's how good Lorelei can be. Even with a ridiculous team with amazing EVs, we were still one hit away from losing the whole thing. Alright, sadly, Bruno is up next. As a Fighting-type specialist with a team of five, our team has been selected for us. There are only five Pokemon who are quad weak to fighting, and they are Tyranitar, Sneasel, and the Aggron line. You may notice a fainted Raikou in the party, but that was just to make it easier to get past Lorelei. I'm not sure this team were really up to it, but that's not what they're being tested on. Let's see how they deal with Bruno. The battle starts off nice and easy, with Bruno sending an Onyx to deal with Tyranitar. Surf wipes him out in one, and as Bruno went to Giovanni's school of dealing with Surf, he calls on Onyx number two. Tyranitar picks up a second knockout, and if it all goes this well, this battle really won't take long. Hitmonchan comes in third, and as he's actually a fighting type, we recall Tyranitar and send in Aron. As Tyranitar has started a sandstorm in here, we're just gonna force Hitmonchan to weather that for as long as possible. Aron's first protect shatters as Hitmonchan's sky uppercut lands. On her second attempt, there's only a 50% chance of success, but protect works and sky uppercut fails to reach Aron once more. By the third turn, there's only a 1 in 4 chance of pulling off protect, but Aron's on it today. After blocking three attacks, Aron's fourth protect fails and Sky Uppercut one-shots her, but she did more than I was expecting. Laron's up next, and this strategy probably won't come as a surprise. We start things off by calling for protect. I'm sure Hitmonchan's wrist is getting a bit sore at this point, but we're not done yet. Laron also succeeds on the second attempt, but falls short of Aron by failing the third. Hitmonchan's Sky Uppercut knocks out another Pokemon, but Aron and Laron have done exactly what we wanted. When Tyranitar returns to battle, the Sandstorm takes Hitmonchan below half health, so he's right where we want him. From there, Tyranitar's Fire Boss can score the knockout, and it does just that. Hitmonchan goes down, leaving us in a 3 on 2. Bruno sends in his Hitmonlee next, who's treated to the exact same Fire Blast that just burnt up Hitmonchan. It doesn't do enough for a one shot, so he counters with Brick Break, which Tyranitar just about tanks. Fire Blast finishes off Hitmonlee, so now only Machamp remains. We stay in with Tyranitar, not wanting to risk a miss, go for Surf, which deals some solid damage. Machamp's Rock Team knocks out Tyranitar, so down to two, we send out Aggron. Another Surf chips away more HP as Machamp counters with Cross Chop and misses. I guess we are in a speed tie because on the next turn, Machamp strikes first with Cross Chop. A critical hit easily knocks off Aggron, so now we're down to a one-on-one. -on -one. All right, the one thing we have on our side with Sneasel is the knowledge that we'll definitely outspeed. We have to start with Double Team to get the odds on our side. By raising Sneasel's evasion, we move the odds of cross Chop hitting to around a 50-50 and we get lucky with a miss. Another Double Team follows, and now cross Chop is more likely to miss than hit. It goes wide again, and with Machamp low on health, we call for Slash. Sadly, Bruno uses a full restore, so there's a lot of work to do. We go for another Double Team, and for the third time, Machamp fails to hit the right Sneasel. 
We raise Sneasel's evasion once more, but Machamp is now out of PP for Cross Charm. Even Rock Tomb has less than a 1 in 3 chance of landing though, so the stones collapse onto the ground and nothing else. We can definitely take a Rock Tomb though, so now it's time to attack. Slash lands twice more as Sneasel darts out of the way of another couple of Rock Tombs, and with almost no health remaining, Machamp is treated to another full restore. The luck stays on our side though, as Sneasel keeps slicing up Machamp and then dodging Rock Tomb until the damage from Sandstorm is finally too much. Machamp faints, and we've beaten Bruno. With all of the double teams, the odds were on our side for all but Machamp's first attack, but the odds of Sneasel dodging all of them was around 1 in 40. We got extremely lucky there. That luck was needed though. This battle took a lot of hours to get through, but now there are only three to go. The final two Elite Four members specialize in more typings that don't give us any quad weak options, so we're going to treat it like the battles with Gary and find a match for each Pokemon instead. Against Agatha, we will at least have one quad weak Pokemon matching Heracross up against her Golbat. Other than that, I've taken it easy on myself. We'll be using Alakazam and Gengar against her two Gengars, Celebi against Arwok, and Kadabra against Haunter. The Bruno battle took a really long time, okay? I'm allowed to have an easier one. Agatha leads off with her first Gengar, and we start out with Alakazam. One psychic attack knocks out the ghost, so good start. Golbat is up next, and that means Heracross has another flying type to overcome. Something you may not know, I do a test run before just about every battle in every challenge I do to get an idea of what the opposition are going to do and when they'll use which Pokemon. On the test run against Agatha, Heracross actually got a critical hit on Double Edge to get past Golbat. What you're watching now is the 38th recorded attempt at this battle. After getting lucky in the test run, it then took 38 more tries for Heracross to finally get another critical hit on Double Edge. In that span, Golbat got a critical hit on Air Cutter six times. It was very frustrating. Another reason that the test run worked out was that I was fairly certain Arbok was up next so could correctly send in Celebi rather than having to reset. After saving it for the whole game, I finally decided to eat Celebi Psychic here, not seeing a place for it in the final two battles. The Guardian of the Forest makes full use of it, one-shotting Arbok to take Agatha down to two. Against her second Gengar, I just settled on calling for Destiny Bond on every turn and hoping for the best. Even though it takes a while and we're put to sleep and given nightmares, the plan eventually pays off as Shadow Ball finishes off our Gengar. Agatha's ace goes down too, so now it's all up to Kadabra. Haunter is sent in and she's just no match for the psychic type. It's another one shot that signals the end for Agatha, and with that, we can move on to Lance. As Dragon is only super effective against Dragon, there aren't any Pokemon quad weak to Dragon types. So instead, we've got Golem for Gyarados, Articuno for Aerodactyl, and three Dragons to take on Lance's Dragonairs and Dragonite. Alright, this is it, the final Elite Four member. Let's get into it. Lance's Gyarados doesn't actually have any Water-type moves, so Golem isn't really at much risk. After a Dragon Rage, three hits of Rock Blast take down Gyarados to give us the early lead. Latios comes in next and takes down Dragonair number one with Dragon Breath, and then we repeat it exactly with Latias and Dragonair number two. It's occurring to me as I write this that I could have used Heracross against Dragonite, but it's too late now. Rayquaza makes pretty quick work of him with Dragon Claw after surviving an outrage anyway, so we're all good. The final face-off sees Articuno against Aerodactyl. Thanks to a maxed out defense stat, Articuno lives through ancient power, meaning Ice Beam can finish the battle. Alright, having slowly but surely taken down the Elite Four, we've finally made it to the champion. Gary has, of course, beaten us through the Elite Four though, so that's who we'll be facing. There aren't any drastic changes from our last team, but Scizor's back now, and Articuno's replacing Agron as our ride-on match. The rest is unchanged. Heracross, Primate, Golem, and Swampert fill out the team. I really never thought we'd make it this far. Let's see if we can finish this off. As is tradition, we get the battle going with Heracross and Pidgeot. Brick Break lands first, taking the flying type below half health as Gary calls for Sand Attack. Knowing an attack is coming next, we go for Counter as Pidgeot's Aerial Ace makes contact. The attack takes Heracross into red health, but that just means counter hurts even more. Pidgeot faints, so job done for Heracross. Primate vs Alakazam is up second, but at this point the Psychic type has finally upped his speed enough to be quicker, so we're in trouble. Luckily, despite having Psychic available to him, Gary calls for Future Sight. Return doesn't quite do enough to score the knockout, so Gary breaks out a full restore to keep Alakazam in it. Another return takes him back into one-shot range before he tries and fails to use Future Sight once more. Primeape's return finishes the job, but that was very lucky. Swampert's up against Executor next, and the battle starts with the Water Ground type taking Alakazam's future sight. That's a bit unfair in the context of the video, but there's no avoiding it. Swampert's Ice Beam can't quite KO Executor, but we get the freeze, so we're all good. 
Gary uses another full restore, but that just ends the battle for Executor. It allows Swampert to attack twice, and two Ice Beams wipe out Gary's Grass type to hand us another win. Alright, 3 for 3. Rhydon is up next. We send in Articuno, who's a late addition to our rival battles, but a welcome one. A single Ice Beam makes quick work of the Pokemon we chose as our starter way back when, and leaves only two face-offs to go. Up first, we've got Scizor vs Arcanine. Intimidate makes this a whole lot harder, but I know it's doable. Secret Power paralyzes the God Dog to start, so that's pretty much ideal. It stops Arcanine from attacking, and expecting a possible full heal, we call for Secret Power again. Gary doesn't use an item though, instead going for an attack, but the paralysis works for us once again. Slash then scores a critical hit for Scizor, ignoring the attack drop, wiping out Arcanine to take Gary down to 1. Blastoise is sent out last, and we bring in Golem. Finally, after making it to the Elite Four, Gary has replaced Water Gun with Hydro Pump. Thankfully, there's a 1 in 5 chance that it misses, and that's exactly what happens here. Hydro Pump goes wide with the mark, and Golem uses Explosion, one-shotting Blastoise to hand us the win and complete the challenge. In case it's unclear, that was not the first attempt. Heracross was able to take care of Pidgeot without any issue, but Alakazam used Psychic like 80% of the time. If he used Future Sight once though, he stuck to it for some reason. We also needed a bit of luck with Executor, either a Freeze or a Crit. That wasn't the worst though, taking down Arcanine required just about everything to go our way. It was around 30 runs at Arcanine before we finally got the win, which was particularly painful as it took quite a lot just to reach the fire type. I think I willed Blastoise to mess up Hydro Pump because after all of the struggles against Arcanine, the first time we made it to Blastoise, he missed. Anyway, there you have it. This incredibly long journey and video has finally reached its conclusion. You can beat Pokemon Fire Red using Quad Week Pokemon. If people enjoyed this one, then I'll consider trying it in other regions, but this took a serious amount of setup and the battles took a long time. I did have a lot of fun with it though. If you somehow made it this far, then thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.